Hello and welcome. We're excited to create and share this very first episode of the Tech and Innovation Show, which is featured on YouTube and podcast with Brad Nelson and David Linthicum, Deloitte Chief Cloud Strategy Officer, and James Staten, who is the Vice President and Principal Analyst and Cloud-Based Innovations at Forrester Research. This show is created by Nelson Hilliard, Cloud Computing Recruitment Specialist, placing great people in cloud, IoT, fintech, and AI. Hi, Dave and James. A warm welcome to you both. It's exciting to have you both on the first tech and innovation show this week. Yeah, it's great to be here, and it's great that uh, James brought this up. I'm really looking forward to this show. Oh, yeah. We're going to be able to really affect people's lives in a very positive way. That's excellent. Uh, look, I'm thoroughly up, up for doing this show as well. I think it's a great idea. Let's open it up with this question then. Why tech-driven innovation needs to be a high priority then, James? Well, if, if everybody's listeners talk to their organization and they look into how they feel about their current products and services, if they feel that they are well positioned and will be in the future, be prepared to be disrupted and destroyed at least by the year 2025. In today's era of agile digital transformation, your customers' wants and needs are shifting faster than ever before, and their flexibility to shift to new and emerging solutions that is so much easier than it ever has been in the past. And this means that for them to ensure future market leadership, you need to be focused on tracking their evolving needs and desires and shifting your roadmaps to advance these needs before they become standard. Uh, look, I, I, well, agree I, with, I agree with you, James. And sorry, I've just got to say one thing before Dave, sorry, Dave, before you jump in on that one. I just thought the way you said destroyed and smiled at that same point was, was going to send a shiver down every business's uh, innovation spine. Um, but uh, back over to you, back over to you oh, now, Dave, for something sensible yeah. to say. <laughs> No, I couldn't agree more. I mean, just look at look at what's occurring in the business right now. I mean, uh, new car companies are jumping into the market, which were, you know, almost impossible to do 30 years ago. Um, you know, there's a new electric truck on the market, new electric motorcycles in the market. And really, they're able to weaponize technology to take things into the into a space that didn't exist before. And, and this is going to go on over and over again over the next 10 years. And I wrote a like I said, I wrote a blog. Uh, a couple of months ago called the brand apocalypse. I think ultimately we're going to see a big shift in the traditional brands into these new innovative brands coming forward. So it's not just Uber and Airbnb and Netflix and all the ones we point to. This is going to be a fundamental change in the way in which we look at technology kind of drive the next generation of the economy. And so the ability to disrupt the insurance space, manufacturing space, um, you're, you know, you can build and and deploy a, a, a factory space in a, in, a, in a fraction of the time it took 20 years ago, your ability to get a product into the market in a few months versus a few years, these things are coming. And, and the thing is, I think the larger companies out there, the multi-billion dollar Global 2000 companies that have made a living kind of dominating a market space are going to find that they're going to be disrupted where they thought they couldn't be disrupted. I mean, you talk to the insurance companies 10 years ago and you tell them about insurance companies coming into the space and disrupting their space by automating be better, by pleasing customers in ways in which they never thought. Uh, the ability to kind of leverage AI technology, uh, um, you know, next generation serverless technology, cloud technology, to provide a more agile way in which they can enter into the market and change the existing, you know, products that they're offering. You know, they say you're crazy, and the fact of the matter is, it's occurring right now. I'm seeing it occur on both sides of the, both sides of the fence. The Global 2000 companies are in essence hoping they're not disrupted, but understand that probably a little disruption is coming where there's a major weapons you know, cache in terms of some of these disruptors out there that are well-funded, that are looking to get into the space and absolutely not only change the market, but change the way in which we receive the market. And it's, it's both an exciting time for people who are like myself, you know, big fans of technology and how we can weaponize technology and kind of take our companies to the next level, but it should be hugely scary for these Global 2000 companies. They may find they're falling by the wayside um, because these other companies are able to outthink them and out-innovate them and out-technologically them, uh, if that's a word. And, and I think it's going to be a um, um, you know very interesting five to ten years. What do you think, James? Oh, totally. And I'm glad that you brought up the examples of industries that think, well, the disruption will happen in the automotive industry. It won't happen to us. 
what they have to look at is not necessarily is someone who's already in their market going to cause the disruption, but are the disruptions in other markets going to invalidate what they offer into markets today? So using your example of, of as cars are becoming autonomous. Well, if, if my core business in, in the insurance world is to insure people's cars and suddenly everybody moves away from owning a car and they're just using these autonomous cars that are out there, my business is gone. And so every company needs to be thinking about what is changing in my customers' lives and how can I accommodate those changes? How can I help them make those changes? And how can I make sure that our relevance to them goes up through this transformation? And that's really key to driving forward. And if they don't want to go down this path and they simply say, no, no, my market is going to be here forever, be prepared to be disrupted and destroyed by 2025. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, just an example, um, you know, I, if my car needs new tires, uh, I have to go through this very archaic process of going into a tire dealership and, you know, talking to a salesperson and picking out some tires I probably don't understand much about in terms of how they're going to, you know, drive different mileage and traction and, you know, wet handling, things like that. Versus pulling up an app on my phone, you know, taking a picture of my VIN number and suddenly having this array of tires coming up and a very, um, you know, a, a very intelligent process that takes me through picking tires. And not only picking tires, but the ability to set an appointment to have the car, the tires replaced, uh, have the, um, you, know, uh, you know, have it done at work, have it done at home, and have it done completely transparent for me having to deal with any kind of pain points going forward. And whether I'm getting food delivered or picked up, uh, you know, picked up for a ride to the airport or, you know, all these other things that are very automated these days, I expect this level of automation that really didn't occur 20 years ago. And I think the big guys, the big companies out there don't anticipate that desire. They think that everything's going to be traditionally focused. I remember having an argument with a, a person who was in the retail space. I talked to him about, uh, you know, 20 years ago, how online retail is going to be a, a big drive going forward. And this is something you should look at because the online, the ability for people to go out and you know buy things online is really going to be the way they're going to, going to prefer to buy things. And they were perplexed by that, almost laughed me out of the room, because they think people want to go out and have an experience and touch things going forward. I think most people in this, in this country could care less, as long as they can see it, understand it, see the reviews out there, do the research of it, you know, things like that, and ability to have this, this kind of a, a knowledge and this perception of what I'm looking to buy, you know, beyond this having to drive someplace and waste fossil fuels and, you know, go into a place and talk to people you probably don't want to talk to them, even though they're perfectly nice people, um, to pick a product or a service that, quite frankly, is going to end up wasting two hours of my time that I could do other things with, you know, spend it with my family or go off and do a hobby or go exercise or work out. So people are really kind of opting for this experience out there where we're in essence being delighted by technology. You know, whether that's buying a Tesla, which you do online and it's delivered and you can monitor the production of it, you know, during its complete build process, they make an appointment for when you're gonna pick it up and they can even deliver it to you. Um, you know, to the ability to, to, to order anything you want, a food product that can be delivered via Uber Eats or anything out there. And I think people just don't understand that this is coming to the next level. So it's not just kind of the personal things we're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis, but it's the way in which we deal with insurance, the way in which we buy a house, the way in which we build a house. You know, all these sorts of things are gonna be disrupted going forward. We're gonna 3D, be 3D printing houses in the next 20 years. Um, the ability to design things via the CAD CAM systems that are gonna be, you know, uh, $500 that we can install in a garage that actually print parts you know, for our automobiles, it would typically cost us $600 for six cents. Um, so there's gonna be so much change that's going forward. I just don't think the businesses understand the rapid pace of change. They're underestimating it and they're gonna end up being thrown under their tires. Very true. And it is sad because as you said, so many companies, when they say they're innovating, all they're doing is incrementally tech enabling their existing products and services. That's not the kind of response that is going to address the evolving needs of, and changes that are happening with your citizens and your customers. And you need to really focus on those things. And oftentimes you should be looking at what is a unique value proposition that is going to happen with all of our customers, but has now only happened with one, this small audience. Well, go after and help that small audience. A good example of this, you were talking about how we're gonna see 
cars and homes be built in 3D? Well, this past year, um, where I live in California, the beautiful retirement village in Northern California called Paradise, California, got completely destroyed by the storms that were up there. 50,000 people lost either their home, their business, or people in their community. And sadly, they're going to be sitting there for 18 months or more as the, as the existing solutions try to rebuild the town and give them the things they're looking for. Well, what they ought to do is they ought to partner with organizations like um, USC's engineering school, who is investing exactly in 3D printing and has built out a robotic system that can actually build a house in less than three days. And if you can empower and change the lives of the people in Paradise, California, don't think you have to wait for the next storm for the next sale. There's going to be people who want those homes fast. So obviously we're praying at the same church <clears throat> Jameson, but going forward, you know, how do we get people to kind of realize the pace of change that's going to occur and their ability to kind of build systems and leverage technologies that are going to be um, provide them with the capabilities of making things, driving the innovation, you know, driving a culture of innovation within these organizations. There's two layers, I think, that are that are uh, need to be changed. Number one, the culture, which is probably the hardest thing to change. And then really kind of the adoption of the enabling technologies, which means creating technology that can be changed or can change things at the pace we need to change. So what would your advice be to a Global 2000 CEO that uh, you're sitting with uh, you know, at a bar and um, he, he looks kind of sad because he's, he's worried about his business going forward because they're not innovative enough? Yeah, and as you said, I would love to be able to say to him, change your culture, but like you said, it's, that's, that's a long task. It's going to take him a while to get there. And so the best thing for him to do is to start off down that process with the second thing you recommended. Start off with a clearly identified change that your customer needs and start getting your, a small team inside your company, partner with a third-party ecosystem partner, partner with a startup to work on a solution to that problem that's been identified. And then when you have successfully addressed what they're looking for, now you have evidence that you can take to the rest of your company, to your full C-suite, to your board, to your HR department, and really say, look, when we invest in innovations, look at the new values we put forth. Let's not make this the exception as it is today. Let's make this the new path forward. And once you've done that, then you can inspire all of your employees to participate if you allow them to participate in the first phase of most people's innovation paths, ideation. Let them think of ideas that they think would help satisfy customer needs. Let them leverage their engagements with your customers where they identify and bring forth the evidence of what is needed. And then get your IT organization and your tech innovation teams to align the emerging technologies to the ideas that have been brought up. So what about the future of the fast followers out there? So lots of organizations, Global 2000 organizations that uh, wait for a couple of companies to be successful in the space and then uh, follow quickly with their own offering, which is very much almost like a clone of what the uh, initial innovative organization is doing. Probably the best example would be Blockbuster, you know, coming out with their own streaming video service, um, you know, probably, you know, five years after Netflix launched theirs. and. That didn't work out very well. So what would you say to organizations who are looking to do that? Is that something that should be some sort of a viable strategy or is this something that's gonna be the death of a thousand cuts? Well, it is, it is a viable strategy because if a disruptor enters your market, you cannot just ignore them. You do need to respond to them. But as you said, you need to respond as quickly as you can when they have entered your market. And you do not want to just offer the same thing they are. You want to look at your assets and your capabilities and your position in the market and say, can I offer the same thing with this enhancement and this enhancement? And now customers will want me over that product. That's really important to move it forward. But then the other key aspect here is if all of your innovation efforts are the incremental improvements of adding tech to your existing products and disrupting, uh, responding to a digital disruptor, that is not going to make you the leader. That is a fast follower methodology with the question being, what do you define as fast? Because as you said, you know, you know, the response that we saw in that example was five years later. Most companies, when they respond to a digital disruptor, do it two years later. Um, that's not good enough. If you want to take over that market, you need to respond way faster than that. 
And that's really critical. But again, don't just focus on incremental and disruptor response. You should be thinking about how can you be the market disruptor yourself? So what questions should I be asking if they've, they've been disrupted? So in other words, I'm a Global 2000 company, you know, I'm same an automobile manufacturer, um, and I have Tesla entering into my market. They've done everything better than I've done, including building a better car and better process and better pricing, you know, better value delivery, um, better assimilation into the government policies and regulations. You know, all these sorts of things are better. And so I've had this question a lot. And so they're like, well, what do we do now? Do we be a fast follower and in essence replicate many of those processes? Do we innovate something that's new and innovative in the space that they don't necessarily have? And if so, do they have the culture and they were they able to weaponize their technology to take things to the next level? So what are the, and that's a very difficult question to answer by the way. So what are kind of the core advice, generic advice you would give to an organization like that? Yes, the generic advice is to, okay, if we go after this same digital disruptive play, what is it about our position in the market, what people think about us, how they view us as different than the other vendors that are out there, that we should make sure carries over into the value proposition of our digital disruptive response. Um, and as you were talking about in the car industry, you know, there's still a significant amount of people who do not want to buy a car from Tesla because they have been a Mercedes buyer for years and they love all the incredible interior experiences that they provide um, and they want that same experience. Okay, well, take a look at what you could do. And what's interesting is Tesla has taken a step that a lot of innovative companies don't do but really should think about. They took the patents on the intellectual property they created that allowed them to build the cars that they have and they open sourced them because they knew that if the overall car market did not make the shift over to electric cars, that they were always going to be an exception for a large amount of buyers. Well, now, if Mercedes were to say, okay, let's take that intellectual property of theirs, let's apply it to our own cars, and let's keep that Mercedes experience that so many of our customers absolutely love, that would be a fantastic way to take it forward. Another example of this would be some of the great truck manufacturers that are out there. Tesla still does not have a truck or an SUV uh, that most people who drive SUVs call an SUV. And that is because those people like the brands they buy from. And so there's an opportunity for them to really take this forward. And one of the reasons that Tesla doesn't have SUVs and pickup trucks and so forth right now is because that when they've tried to go down the path of the pickup truck, they were getting maybe 100 miles um, uh, on the electric power that's there. Well, if you take their technology and you apply it to things you've been studying and you've been learning on your own, and you bring the first truck to market that has 300 miles, you have just disrupted them. Yeah, disrupting the disruptor is something I hear a lot. And so ultimately, even preemptive disrupting, the ability to kind of just, you know, basically innovate in a space that hasn't been disrupted yet. And that's kind of, you know, core to, I would tell any manufacturer out there, anybody who's in business, who's doing something now that's a traditional, in business, you're gonna get disrupted at some point in time. So what new and innovative are you gonna do that's gonna preempt the disruptors from even getting into your market? Because if I'm a new startup or an investor, typically, they're going to look at the space. They're saying there's no net new opportunity here because these larger guys, the global 2000 companies, they're becoming innovative unto themselves. So the ability to kind of get out ahead of it has a couple of benefits. Number one, they're able to get net new technology into the space. You know, it may not be proven or not, but they're in essence going to be a disruptor unto himself. But they're going to end up disrupting the, disrupting the disruptor. That's a bit of a tongue tie because ultimately people aren't willing to invest in something that somebody else already owns in the space that's a stronger company. So it, it kind of pays for them twice to be innovative. Number one is they get the benefit from the innovation and they get the ability to kind of preemptively um, push away you know, some of the pushers in the space. And, but I haven't seen any Global 2000 companies kind of consider it that way. They don't really kind of consider the value. They, they, they consider it as uh, uh, research and development is really kind of a sunk cost, is something you have to participate in. Um, typically, you're going to look at the market and kind of take an abstraction of where the market is going and take a position in the space, but it's typically not going to be an aggressive position in the space. So we need to think differently in terms of the status quo, which I think is where you know everything's falling down. I run across this all the time, where 
we're not looking at leveraging technology in ways in which we can innovate and push our business forward. We're looking at being reactionary. So I guess it comes down to this. We're not being proactive. We're being reactive. And by doing that, I think everybody who's going to be reactive is going to end up getting pushed down in the market just because of the fact the pace of change. They're becoming the point where the change is occurring, you know, say 20 years ago, it occurred at this level and the global 2000 companies were able to keep up with it. Now I think it's occurring at 10 times that, probably 20 times that in many instances, some of the marketplaces that are out there. And if you're not willing to, in essence, adapt your technology, adapt your people, adapt your thinking around the pace of change, you're going to fall behind pretty quick and you're going to be left behind in your marketplace. And I, I just don't think that people you know, kind of get that um, and the board of directors don't get that. I think there are going to be some major kind of disruptions in the space where we're going to see missing numbers and stocks plummet and you know, like I said, name brand companies are going to end up uh, selling or changing their name or getting, you know, combining with other companies going forward, the brand apocalypse. But all of this, I think, is preventable. You know, don't you think this is a little bit, you know, forward thinking in these companies? And I really hate to see these guys suffer because you know, the employees suffer, the investors suffer, the executives suffer. What would you be your advice to them? Yeah, and it has a lot to do with what is my company's focus. Is our company's focus on hitting our goals for this quarter? Is it hitting our goals for this year? Um, or is it to ensure that we are indeed a market leader and loved by our customers five years in the future? And too often companies don't focus on the latter because if they're publicly held, they're judged by Wall Street and oftentimes by their board members on the first two criteria. And so they have to stay focused on that. We see this a lot with government agencies as well. A lot of government agencies, they need to make sure that they spend every dollar in their budget by the end of the year. Otherwise, they're not going to get that budget back the following year. And so they don't really understand that you don't have to spend the money the same way you did, but you should be spending it in ways that empower new capabilities and functionalities. Because while you may not be a corporate entity who cares about the revenue and the profit comes in, if the market changes around you, be prepared for the market to disrupt you as a government agency and maybe even walk away from your country. So what kind of innovation metrics should we be pushing out there? I, I mean, I've been thinking about this a lot, you know, just in my own work, you know, I was coming up with a methodology or some way to gauge your ability to innovate in your space and where you should be innovating, how much you should be spending, how much ROI you can expect back from innovation, depending on the sector, whether it's finance, healthcare, you know, retail, manufacturing, things like that. Is it possible to create metrics very much like we do with other financial metrics, earnings per share, things like that, maybe innovation per share, the ability to have forward looking five years in terms of the ability to put out new products and services that are likely to, to kind of create value in the space and the risk of doing that. And, you know, I hate to, you know, kind of bear this down to mathematics, but I think that, you know, people who are investing in these companies, they always want the ability to kind of understand um, why I'm putting this money forward, what I can expect from the investment, what are my core metrics and best practices in doing that? Is it possible to do that or is this something that's gonna be pie in the sky right now? It very is possible to do that, but what you don't wanna do is put those metrics against individual innovations. You wanna put those metrics on the overall objective of your innovation organization. And what you really wanna focus on is what is our customer's satisfaction levels today? and how are those changing? Then what are we investing in that aligns to these needs that customers are articulating or that we are seeing change in the market that will affect how the customer goes forward? And of those efforts, what level of validation from our customers have we heard about those investments that then verify and justify continuing to invest in those things and ultimately bring them to market? Then when the solution has 100% been verified and it is now ready to bring to market, then you can go back to the traditional KPIs and you can measure that product based on its revenue goals, its objectives, and so forth. And during those earlier innovation processes where you're validating and verifying that this does align with the customer's looking for, you can test pricing models as well that allow you to then say what is going to be the revenue impact if we're successful with this. I think we just defined a uh, million dollar offer by Forrester. What do you think? <laughs> that definitely is a key area of my research engagement with clients. Absolutely. Yeah, I think it's going forward and in, in kind of understanding ultimately. I mean, one thing, you know, innovation, innovation, that new, net new, you know, kind of doing some, but 
The, the reality is, is we're trying to get businesses thinking differently in how they're leveraging technology in ways that are different than the past. And so we talk about tactical technology like cloud computing, and yes, I said it, it can be tactical technology. You know, talk about the IoT and edge computing and serverless computing, you know, basically all the shiny, shiny objects out there. What we're trying to do is get to an infrastructure, get to a technological state that has the ability to kind of change and move quickly in these spaces to enable people to take the business to the next level. You know, one of the things that drove me nuts, you know, when I was working for a global 2000 company, actually a global five company, um, was that if I wanted to build anything, I never when it took forever for me to get the uh, funding approved, but I had to get hardware, software, I had to figure out data center space, operational space, I had to submit an ops plan, you know, all this stuff in kind of a procedural nature. So to get an application or a database up and running in that, in that company, which was a critical you know, system that would save us millions of dollars a month, you know, it typically took a year or two just to get through the, the you know, political infrastructure, things like that. So we're getting to a point where we do have this push button technology, ability to kind of use things on demand. And that's been around for a long period of time, but still people do things in a traditional way. They don't use DevOps, they don't use cloud computing. You know, they don't use new and nifty technology. And I'm not saying you surely should manage my magazine and adopt everything that's coming down the line. But ultimately, I think we're not putting the value on this technology transformation as we should be uh, within these organizations. And we had the folded arm gang a few years ago, and those guys have kind of fallen by the wayside. Now everybody's kind of bought into cloud and DevOps and things like that. But the pace of change to get these technologies enabled and get them working in these organizations isn't at the point where I think it has a you know kind of a critical priority uh, within the, the global 2000 space. So what fundamental shifts should we occur and you know, where should they, they happen? Is it a cultural issue, a financial issue, uh, investor issue? You know, where are the sensitive spots to poke the elephant to make it dance? Yeah, so culture is definitely one of the big factors for sure. And uh, financial is one as well. But also to your point, this is where ecosystem engagement is another thing that you should change. If you have partners and you have potential companies you can partner with who are willing to invest in these areas, who have more of the innovation culture that you're trying to bring into your own company, through that partnership, you can start to express to your company, look, see how they do this, see how they do this. This is the stuff that works for them. That's why they're positioned the way they are. That should be our future as well. And you can really carry it forward. And exactly to your point also, you when you're doing these new innovations, you don't wanna just look at the emerging technologies. You wanna look at the technology chains that are necessary to bring all of this forward. And that is oftentimes going to be taking advantage of the shift to cloud of infrastructure and application design and agile capabilities, and then putting the emerging technologies on top of them. And by bringing all of these things together, that allows you to iterate these solutions so much faster. Um, and as we've learned very much how Amazon and Microsoft with Azure behave, both companies want to add new emerging technologies and services to their platforms when their customers tell them they need it. And if you do take advantage of building the solutions in partnership with them, and they let you build on top of their investments in the emerging technologies, then you gain from what they have done without having to make the investment yourself. And that can make it so much easier for your board and for your culture change to recognize, oh, so we're only having to invest 20% in this, and our partner is investing 80% of this? Oh, wow, this is huge. So we're weaponizing other people's technology for ourselves. Exactly. In essence, arms buying arms in the open market, uh, <laughs> but the arms are cloud going hey, forward. Arms. <laughs> yeah, guys, thank you so much. What a great show! I was actually going to mention about you know the fact that innovation and uh, disruption at the moment seems to be driven by visualization in social media, from what I've seen. So a lot of brands without a visual presence in something like Instagram, or you know maybe that's the predominant one now, they're they're really finding their market share through innovation of of uh, how they can graphically convey their message to a market share and captivate an audience where they can shift that innovation and disrupt other market shares via you know keeping a, a captive audience on something like Instagram so um, that was one of my observations
innovations that I've seen big organizations that have, that have really missed out uh, because they've not been quick to the market to visualize their brand uh, and be innovative when it comes to embracing something as, uh, as basic as a picture on Instagram. So essentially what we're talking about is market led by Joe Bloggs. It's the, it's the, the, the public which are determining the future of the big brands by you know, how they're perceiving the brand in the marketplace, what their customer experience is of the brand and, and how that brand can innovate in a digital world to, to still keep that market and, and intrude more on their personal life, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's the idea of innovation. Crude less. Delight more, intrude less. <laughs> Excellent chaps. Thank you so much for being part of the innovation show. The very first one. It's so exciting. Um, so look, we're going to be doing these regularly and uh, James and Dave are going to be a part of these shows. So thanks for watching everyone. Uh, James, thanks for being part of the innovation show. It's been awesome. Oh, yeah, glad to do it. And uh, you know what would be kind of cool for us to think about in the future um, is bringing in clients from my company and from David's company um, who are driving innovation um, or are responsible for new innovations that have been announced to the market. And then interviewing them and uh, you know sharing, get, getting their shared thoughts about how they drove this. So we're going to yell at them for twenty minutes. Is that your idea, James? <laughs> <laughs> I understand. I think it would be good getting a perspective because it is. No one out there does not want to be innovative, but you know they they are looking for advice how to do so within their cultural restrictions, within their financial restrictions, and within their technological restrictions. And so the difficult thing is how. What their current state is, their as is state, how do they get to the to be state, and all the steps in between. And the thing is, lots of nuances uh, that need to occur, lots of different technological changes need to occur, and it has to occur on a procedural basis, skill changes, things like that, lots of moving parts. And I think it's a science unto itself, as you, I guess you're discovering. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's great. And, and Dave, thanks so much for being part of the Innovation Show. Always, it's a pleasure to podcast and video cast with you. You got it, man. Look, thanks for watching, everyone. And look, let's all connect on social media as well. So you can get James on Twitter, which is at Staten7. David's on Twitter at David Linthicum. I'm on Twitter at Nelson underscore Hilliard. Uh, we've got all the standard stuff in the description box, so check that out. This will be going out on iTunes and Stitcher for the podcast as well. So uh, if no one wants to watch us, uh, you can listen to us at least anyway. So look, thanks for watching the first Innovation and Tech Show. Really appreciate your time and your support. So remember to like, subscribe and comment uh, to this show and the channel and everything like that. So it's great to be a part of the, uh, the Cloud Tech Innovation community as it were. And uh, look forward to some great shows coming up as well. So thanks for watching. <laughs>